All right, guys, I'm going to do a quick podcast here on range of motion. Uh, a lot of this is a follow-up to the uh, uh, to the lab we had yesterday. So a lot of this will be a review. All right, so what is range of motion? So you learned in test and measure, it's, it's a uh, range of motion. It's a technique used to examine movement. Uh, and then we can also use range of motion as a treatment, so as a therapeutic in intervention. Um, it is a functional excursion of movement. And so without range of motion, you don't uh, have the functional ability to uh, utilize your extremity or your trunk. Uh, some of the things that can limit range of motion. This is something you learned in anatomy, but so this should be a review. And one is active insufficiency. Uh, this occurs in a two-joint muscle when a muscle is incapable of shortening to the extent required to produce a uh, full range of motion. So when, let's take your quadricep for example, it flexes at the hip and extends at the knee. When you fully flex at the hip and fully extend at the knee, your quadricep may not be able to uh, shorten any further. Same thing with your hamstring. It extends at the hip and flexes at the knee. If you fully extend at the hip and then try to fully flex at the knee, your hamstring will uh, fully shorten and you can't quite flex at the knee as much as you would like. Where passive insufficiency also occurs in a two joint muscle where you get the stretch on the opposite muscle. So what most often occurs, uh, let's use that quadricep and hamstring again. What most often occurs is if you fully flex at the hip and then try to extend at the knee, what limits you often is that hamstring. So you're passively, you can't fully extend at the knee because the opposite muscle, so the muscle on the other side, is being stretched passively and it limits you. Um, so again, uh, this is this should be a review from your anatomy. If this doesn't make sense, uh, make sure at the beginning of class uh, you ask questions and we can better explain this or give you some examples. All right, what different types of range of motion are there? Passive range of motion, which you learned in acute care, it is produced by an external force, either manual or mechanical. So either you are taking the patient through the motion or a machine can be doing that. Uh, active range of motion is where the patient is moving on their own. And then active assistive is where either there is a combined external and active force, um, or you are using gravity or some kind of device to assist the patient. All right, when do we use passive range of motion? It is good for acute inflamed tissues when active range of motion would be detrimental, such as when there is uh, uh, a recently repaired tissue or when the patient is not able to move actively, such as when they're paralyzed, when they're in a coma, such as the case that we provided. The goals of active range of motion are to decrease complications that would occur with immobilization, maintain joint mobility, minimize contractures, maintain mechanical elasticity of the muscle, assist circulation and vascular dynamics, enhance synovial movement of cartilage for cartilage nutrition, decrease or inhibit pain, assist with healing process after injury or surgery, and maintain the patient's awareness of movement. But there are limitations of passive range of motion. True passive range of motion is difficult to obtain unless the muscle is, um, it is difficult to obtain in a muscle that is innervated when the patient is conscious. Um, it, Passive range of motion does not prevent muscle atrophy. It does not increase strength or endurance. And while it does increase in circulation, it doesn't assist circulation to the same extent that an active muscle contraction would. So when a patient is able and when it's appropriate for active range of motion, active range of motion is typically better. The precautions or contraindications to passive range of motion is any circumstance where motion would be disruptive to the healing process, such as when there's a fracture, a recent surgery, or a DVT. All right, so when a patient can perform active range of motion or active assistive, it is best to do that. Um, so when should you do that? When the patient's able to contract actively, um, when there's weak musculature and they're unable to move through the entire range, you should try active assistive range of motion. Um, 
If there's regions above and below an immobilized joint, you should use active range of motion for those joints to keep them mobile. So the goals of active range of motion are to maintain the elasticity and contractility of those muscles, to provide feedback for the muscles, provide stimulus for, those in, for the bone and the joint integrity, to increase circulation and prevent uh, DVT formation or thrombus formation, and to develop coordination and motor skills. Often you need this active range of motion to gain those, that neuro, neuromuscular control that we're talking about so often. And so before you put a weight in someone's hand or some kind of resistance, they need to be able to perform a movement smoothly with active range of motion, and then you add the resistance into it. So when should you not perform active range of motion? Uh, when it's disruptive to healing. So specific precautions early um, post-operatively or early following an injury. If someone has a uh, grade three tear and you start uh, actively contracting the muscle that is torn, you may be causing more damage than uh, benefit. Range of motion should not be done when their response is life-threatening. Again, worry more about the patient's overall health than their specific joint condition. All right, so when do we apply this active range of motion or passive range of motion or active assistive? Well, we've talked about this. You first evaluate the patient, determine the appropriate level of function, the precautions that are there, and determine if they can perform this active range of motion or active assistive range of motion. Um, determine if it is safe to do so based on the condition of the tissues. Uh, determine which pattern meets the meets their goals. And I will talk about patterns on the next slide, so we will come back to that. Um, monitor the patient response. So um, we talk, we've we mentioned that you always measure. Are we getting um, gain, the gains we want? But also monitor the overall patient. Um, are you causing edema? Are you causing an increase in pain? Are you causing a decrease in pain? Is this helping the patient? Um, are their vitals increasing? With some low-level um, patients who may be in acute care and um, maybe just had a cardiac event or you know, have some major medical problems, active range of motion may increase their heart rate to the extent that just basic active range of motion is a cardiovascular activity. So monitor their vitals when needed. Document, document and communicate their findings. So um, ensure that when you're doing your note that you are putting uh, the appropriate uh, documentation there to uh, back up what you're doing. And then reevaluate and modify as appropriate. All right, there's different range of motion patterns. And again, one is not right or wrong. You just need to determine what is best based on that patient's goals and what your goals are for that patient. So you have the basic anatomic patterns, so frontal, sagittal, transverse, plane. So these are the patients that you're gonna have them do true flexion, true abduction, internal and external rotation. These are good because they can be measured easily. Everybody knows how to measure shoulder flexion, and if you measure it, Chances are I will come behind you and at least relatively closely measure it in a similar way. Um, muscle elongation. So if I want to measure the length of the pectoralis, um, you need to do range of motion in that pattern. But again, every muscle, I could be doing the lower fibers or the middle fibers or the upper fibers of the pectoralis. So not as easy to measure, but we may be stretching the muscle and not in a specific anatomic pattern. Combined patterns would be diagonals, these D1 and D2 patterns um, and the PNF patterns. And then functional patterns. Again, if I'm looking for somebody to be able to put on a belt, I'm interested in whether they can reach behind their back. If somebody wants to be able to uh, serve a tennis ball, I'm gonna be interested in whether they can reach over their head in the position of serving a tennis ball. So whatever functional pattern, whatever they want to get back to doing, I'm going to work range of motion within that pattern.
So what are the benefits of these functional patterns? What well, does assist with these activities of daily living and their uh, instrumental activities of daily living, and it helps the patient realize the value of what we're doing with these range of motion exercises. It also helps to develop motor patterns uh, with the patient. So if a patient is having difficulty getting food to their mouth because they can't bend their elbow enough and you're working their range of motion into uh, a functional pattern trying to get their hand to their mouth, the patient will understand that motor pattern and help develop it uh, in, that, in that way. So when you are positioning somebody for passive range of motion, active assistive range of motion, and active range of motion, you always have to consider the impact of gravity. Uh, you may have to position somebody sidelining to be able to limit uh, gravity. We've talked about mechanical devices that um, move a patient passively, and these are um, uh, in use with continuous passive movement. Um, and this is uh, when a mechanical device moves a joint slowly throughout a preset controlled range of motion. Uh, this picture shows several different types. So the top left is a shoulder continued passive range of motion and it can move you into abduction or external rotation. Um, the next one um, is wrist, uh, knee, and ankle, or maybe ankle and knee, hard to tell the, uh, for those. Um, and these can be used, the machine does the work, the patient lays there and um, and doesn't, uh, is supposed to be as passive as possible. So there are some benefits of a CPM or continue, continuous passive movement. It does prevent the development of adhesions and contractures, and we'll talk about uh, contractures here in a bit. Um, it does help stimulate healing of tendons and ligaments. Uh, some say it enhances the healing of incisions. Um, I think some of that is controversial though. So some people feel that the incisions uh, don't heal as fast with this. It increases synovial fluid lubrication. Uh, it prevents the effects of immobilization. So it prevents that uh, decrease in stiffness that we notice with uh, tissues that have a lot of collagen fiber. It gets a quicker return of range of motion and it decreases post-operative pain. There is some evidence that shows it gets earlier range of motion, but there is no evidence that shows any long-term benefits. So many insurance companies um, don't like to pay for CPMs. Uh, they're, heavy, they're high to rent. The other problem with CPMs that I see is that it requires the patient to lie there passively. Uh, some of the protocols were three hours, three times a day. So for nine hours, the patient is to be supine or sitting in the, the uh, case of a shoulder or wrist, doing nothing but sitting there. Where, um, as we talked about earlier, active movement is always better than passive movement, isn't it? And so if the patient is able to be ambulatory and up, um, it is better, especially in the case of something like a uh, total knee replacement. Now, there are special cases, uh, again, um, that we'll learn about in uh, surgeries where you need that synovial fluid movement. Um, and there's special surgeries that we'll talk about when we get to the knee where CPM use may be beneficial, um, but uh, overall there's there's benefits and limitations to CPMs. I'll tell you kind of my history as, as a PT when I graduated. Every total knee patient got a CPM sit home with them. I haven't seen a CPM used in at least a decade. Um, I We can ask uh, Dr. Hartshorn and Dr. Hodges uh, their history of um, uh, use of CPMs, but when patients have total knee replacements, they don't typically get CPMs anymore. So uh, these have kind of come, the, pen, the pendulum has swung in the other direction. And so general guidelines for CPMs, usually the device is applied immediately after surgery. You can adjust the arc of motion. So uh, when we would set up CPMs, patient would be awake and we'd have it go to where they felt a decent stretch uh, you could also adjust the rate of motion, so how fast the machine moved, and you would want it to move rather slowly. You don't want this thing cranking up and down pretty fast. You'd want it to move uh, 
slowly up until they felt a stretch into flexion, and then slowly moved down until it was into full extension. Um, the protocols vary. I mean, it can be from one hour a day to 23 hours a day, but the typical was about three hours a day, three times a day. Um, and physical therapy is included when they're not on the CPM. Um, but again, as I mentioned, the only thing that it works is mobility. You're not working their cardiovascular system, no strength, no power, no balance, no function. All they're getting is passive range of motion when they're uh, on a CPM. All right, and for these last two slides, I also have some scenarios. We're going to go through some scenarios also during lab on Thursday, but go through these and work through them. If you have questions about them, you can email me or we can talk about them in class on Wednesday or Thursday. But I want you to make sure that if um, you don't have an idea of if this is your patient, kind of what would you do to treat them? And then I have retrieval practice. Be able to do all of these and you're going to be able to uh, um, this is what I expect you to get out of this um, PowerPoint. Now, don't consider this an all-inclusive outline. These are just some questions that um, will help you study, okay? Um, your all-inclusive outline is, unfortunately, that book called Therapeutic Exercise. Um, all right, thank you.